Hi, Mike. My name is PK. I'm Vice President for Development at Amgen, and by training, I'm an oncologist. And so I'm really excited about the chance to talk to you today about innovation and really delighted to hear about your kind of orthogonal thinking and how you came to where you are today. Hey, PK. Uh, orthogonal thinking. I'm going to say that next time somebody says, like, what a crazy idea that is. <laughs> nice to see you. Nice to finally meet you, too. As you know, I lead the Microsoft Garage here in New York. Uh, the Garage program is worldwide. It's an innovation program focused on helping employees explore their curiosity, their experimental nature, uh, their creativity, and really, most important, moving their ideas forward really quickly and seeing what it can do for people. I have a question for you to lead off if you don't mind. I've worked a little bit in this space. Um, when we do our Microsoft Global Hackathon, people come up with health-related projects. It's such an incredibly regulated industry. How do you ever innovate in an industry like that? It must be really difficult. One thing is, um, and I think most of us in, in the healthcare industry feel this way, is if we keep our North Star as patients, then we feel like we need to do whatever we, we can to get those molecules to them as quickly as possible. And that kind of forces you to break the glass a bit, right? Um, and, you know, and by that I mean truly, you know, looking at different mechanisms to either develop a drug faster or look at the impossible being possible. You just described what happened at Microsoft about seven years ago or so when we, we had our new CEO come in and he was a longtime Microsoft guy and he knew that we had to figure out a way to be less risk averse, right? To just to take some chances to like try to find a way to go faster and everybody was ready. I find that fascinating. How did he and how did you change that culture and really widen or change the aperture so that you can look into not just, you know, the, the ability to achieve a certain goal, but actually to potentially achieve a goal you hadn't even thought of? Yeah. One of the very first things he said to everybody at Microsoft was, everybody needs to go innovate. It's not going to be a top-down command and control kind of structure. You know what the right thing to do is, go do it and people really took that to heart. I always like to say innovation is everybody's business. And so we really you know, are doing that every day by asking people to take their ideas, go find a team, join a team, but just try to move that idea forward quickly. When did you know that, that you were really not happy with making incremental changes, that you really wanted to push forward quickly? Probably just like you, I've always felt the need to break the glass a bit and, and change things up. But I remember, you know, in high school, even then, people were suggesting to me, well, this is the way you do it. And I, and I honestly thought to myself, but that's not how I want to do it. I want to do something completely different. And it, it's continued to kind of carry on um, th through my lifetime, honestly. But what about for you? I've been very, very fortunate to always sort of be on the leading edge of like whatever the next big thing is. And, and so for me personally, there's a way of thinking. You know, innovation is not just doing little incremental things and seeing how to make things better. It's having a clear vision for what's possible. And so that's, you know, my, my role in the garage is as an envisioneer, right? So, you know, someone who can both envision what's possible and engineer it well enough to see if it could work. You're doing very interesting research and it's really hard, but at the center of all of it is people. And it must be, it must be difficult some days because you are dealing with, you know, in some cases, the worst day of, of someone's life, right? They find out they have a terrible disease. What's that like for you, trying to work through that? I remember when I first decided to go into oncology, a lot of my family members asked, actually asked me, well, why do you want to do that? My, you know, my grandmother had passed away from breast cancer very, you know, early. Um, and I, I told them that, you know, I, I had actually the best of both worlds because I could actually work to help to cure the patient. But if I wasn't able to cure them, I could at least make their last days the best that I could. And so I really felt that, you know, being the bridge and also helping to get them to cure if, if I could um, was so aspirational but so meaningful to me that I um, thought that that was the best career. This started very personally for you, right, with your grandmother. So that's, you know, it's, it's nice to know that it, you know, it was very important to you personally to do this. It's not like your parents, you know, wanted you to like go off in the medicine. You, you did it because of your passion. That's great. I was looking at your life and, you know, kind of researching you online. You've done so many things that I, I have to ask what you're the most proud of in, in your achievements. So you know I was one of the inventors of Adobe Acrobat and the PDF file format, which 
completely changed an industry, right? Changed the world, really, like how people communicate things that have to be kept, you know, in their original form. That was a lot of fun. But the thing I'm actually most proud of was the first thing I ever designed, which is way back when, at the beginning of the Macintosh, there was, you know, your font menu when you're like you're writing and you have to pick a font to change the font. Well, the font menu used to be all in Chicago in the same font. You couldn't tell what they were. And uh, I did this little hack to change the font menu so you could see what each of the fonts looked like before you picked them. Super simple, ridiculous. I get a lot of satisfaction because it is so simple, but yet built into everything we do. I love that. And what, what is your favorite font if you have one? Well, um, there's, there's a lot of fonts. I, I tend to like the ones that, that look like sci-fi movie, you know, typography, right? And like very futuristic and, and like kind of like cool looking. Hey, PK, what's your best day like at work? When I get to work and I'm excited about getting there and we've got a problem to solve and the team all says, you know, we're not gonna, you know, lie down on this. We're, we're gonna think of a cool way to do this and we're gonna think of an innovative and a fast way to get this done because patients are waiting. Um, that's a lot of days for me, to be frank. And um, every one of them is, is one where you, I think to myself, I'm so lucky to be in the position I, I'm in to helping patients. How about you? A lot of the same. For me, it's those days when you do something incredible with your teammates. And, you know, results in something that, like putting on our global hackathon in the middle of a giant pandemic, like everybody working from home and still pulling off, you know, a worldwide event where 70,000 people are getting involved in some way. There's a lot of days like that. And I'm very fortunate, like you, to be able to, to you know, finish the day off knowing that I did something that was meaningful and important and had some impact. That's awesome. I have to ask you, because this came up in the jar for me, and I thought it would be kind of cool to ask, um, what musical artist was most connected to the soundtrack of your life? I can tell you most of them, if not all of them, are from the 70s. So I'm a big fan of like 70s classic rock, Neil Young, you know, Fleetwood Mac, Tom Petty. So anything from that era, I absolutely love. If you could have lunch with anybody you wanted to, who would that person be? There's many people who would fit that bill for me, but the person is Abraham Lincoln. And um, the reason is obviously, um, you know, really learning about leading through times of unrest, um, forward thinking, and then also, interestingly, he also helped to charter the National Academy of Science. So he was also very scientifically motivated, but to be able to lead a, a country that was so deeply divided, um, you know, towards you know an innovative but difficult decision um, I, I'd love to get his thoughts um, today what about for you well that, that was a great answer for me uh, you know for a person who passed away when I was younger I actually did get a chance to meet Steve Jobs in person several times wow. when I was working at Adobe he was a, a big inspiration for me just because he was so full of uh, vision and passion and charisma and, and really smarts about people are there ideas, like things that, that you know will happen eventually that you just can't get to right now because the science, you know, or the technology or the biology just doesn't exist to allow you to get there right now, but, but you're pretty sure that everyone's gonna end up there? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. So, you know, um, when I look back at, um, you know, where we are with, with some of the, um, T-cell engagers, you know, the, the, the molecules that we're making right now to help engage the immune system. I was trying to explain this to my family, um, you know, a couple of months ago, and I told them, when I first started telling them about this, they said, but it sounds a little bit like sci-fi. And I said, yeah, it is, because when I was in medical school and residency and fellowship, it was science fiction, right? But now we're moving to where, you know, there are certain elements of technology where we think, you know, could we even change this further where, where more and more is, is available off the shelf to really, really jumpstart the immune system to get towards cure? Yeah, the, the reason I asked you that question was um, for, many, many years, I have a very clear vision for how information will be able to be displayed for people in more of a living and breathing way. And so it sounds like science fiction. You know, you read a book, you look at a tweet, you know, you, you, know, you look at a, a billboard, the text just sits there. But right now we have all the technology to actually bring that to life and have it be able to, to morph into the right form to communicate to you you know, I'm a big science fiction fan, so I got to ask you about this incredible science fiction innovation that, you know, many of my favorite authors have written about. 
can we develop something that will, you know, enter the body and, and you know, in a mostly non-invasive way and target disease and be able to either treat it or eradicate it? Is that real? I feel that we have uh, significant components of that right now. You know, I always think about cancer as the, that ultimate evader, right? And the immune system just doesn't see it. And what we found with these bispecifics, by infusing them, they specifically just put on a pair of goggles towards the immune system and they can see that specific marker of the cancer and cause it to engage it and, and kill it. I, what I like more about that concept is that it's utilizing or, or turning on your immune system to do something that can be, have much more longevity than the simple half-life of a molecule or a drug. So as a true innovator, what is the, the biggest thing that you would love to be able to have a hand in helping create you know, helping to get a breakthrough in. All cancers, you know, um, are um, particularly devastating. But I think that, you know, I, I'd say two things. One is to be able to actually cure a cancer um, truly to where the patient can, can doesn't have to look back on that disease anymore. That's a huge goal, no matter what cancer it is. But then the second part is honestly, there are areas of such a met need, particularly in the acute leukemias, um, where, where you know that longevity is actually measured in days to weeks rather than months to years, where I look and say, if we could actually find a cure, you know, what, you know, the amount of days and, and happy memories that we could help patients live further, um, it, it, would, it would give me chills. What you were talking about is very um, near and dear to my heart too. Some beautiful painting you see over my shoulder was done by my late sister Sharon, who lived here in New York for most of her life. So she uh, contracted a very rare form of cancer about 10 years ago. And by the time they found it, it was too late. And so I have a, a very um, deep respect and, you know, and thanks for the kind of work that you're doing because people, it, it is devastating. It's sort of horrible to go through that, whether it's you, the person, or your family, your friends. So I'm, I'm rooting for you. So anything we can do to help, we should definitely work on things that we can do together. Well, I've, I've got to ask you that question of, of what is your favorite quote? My favorite quote of all time came from a fortune cookie. <laughs> Believe it or not. But, and, and it really describes how I approach my work and you know, sort of one of my most um, you know, like rock bedrock beliefs is this quote that came out of the fortune cookie. It said, it's a simple task to make things complex, but a complex task to make things simple. I love it. How about you? You know, mine's kind of simple too. It's, um, you probably have heard it. It's by Nelson M Mandela. And it, it, when he said, you know, it always seems impossible until it's done. I mentioned that we were trying to develop, for example, a molecule targeting KRAS. Um, I remember, you know, just two years ago, speaking to oncologists about this, and, and their answer was very realistic. They said, you know, I like you, but um, you, you know, we've been trying to do this for almost 40 years. Why are you so special? Um, <laughs> you know, if I had a nickel for every time I heard that, right? Yeah. <laughs> we got a lot of things to do together. Exactly. <laughs>